call the meeting on rules, privileges, and elections to order. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am chair of this committee. Before we begin this hearing, I would like to introduce the council members of this committee who have joined us so far today. We have council member Rafael Espinal, council member Vanessa Gibson, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Margaret Chin, Council Member Mark Traeger, and Council Member Rory Lansman. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Lance Palivi and the staff members of the Council's Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer and Andre Johnson-Brown and Julius Caranda investigators. Today, the Rules Committee will consider the nominations of Everardo Jefferson for appointment to the Landmarks Preservation Commission and Gerard Whittington for appointment to the Environmental Control Board. I hope I pronounced your names right. <laughs> If the council gives its advice and consent, Mr. Jefferson, a Manhattan resident and architect, will fill a vacancy and be appointed by the mayor to the Landmark Preservation Commission to complete the remainder of, three, of a three-year term that expires on June 28, 2020. If the council gives its advice and consent, Mr. Whittington, a Brooklyn resident will be appointed by the mayor to the Environmental Control Board as member with a background in noise pollution control to complete the remainder of a four-year term that expires on March 5th, 2023. Pursuant to the New York City Charter S3020, the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, also known as the LPC, is responsible for establishing and regulating landmarks, portions of landmarks, landmark sites, interior landmarks, scenic landmarks, and historic landmarks. The LPC also regulates alterations to designated buildings. The LPC consists of 11 members. These members must include at least three architects, one historian qualified in the field, one city planner or landscape architect, and one realtor, and must include at least one resident from each of the five boroughs. The mayor also designates one of the LPC members to serve as chair of the LPC and designates another member to serve as vice chair of the LPC. These LPC members shall serve until a successor is designated. The members of the LPC, with the exception of the chair, serve without compensa compensation, but are reimbursed for necessary expenses incurred in the course of performing their duties. The chair's annual salary is $212,000 and $44,000. $212,000. Uh, welcome to the candidate, Mr. Jefferson. Um, are you ready to be sworn in? Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do you, miss, do you have an opening statement? Okay. Uh, can you turn the mic on, the button? Hello, can you hear okay. me? Okay. Good morning, Chair Koslowitz, and members of the Committee for Rules, Privileges, and Election. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before you and answer your questions. I would like to thank Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to appear before the committee. It's an honor for me to be nominated for a seat on the Landmarks Preservation Commission. 
As a founding member, of, a founding principal of Capos Jefferson Architects, I spent the last 32 years creating architecture in communities that haven't often been, uh, that have often been underserved by design professionals. We started out small with local projects, such as adding canopies to the housing authority buildings and creating preschools in the former offices of the Bronx Paradise Theater. As work progressed, we came more often to create educational, communal, and cultural anchors around New York City. Many of, our, many of these projects have involved work in landmarks or in landmarks worthy contexts. I know firsthand the importance of development that respects and enhances an important historical resource. At Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, I'm the architect who led the team that created the new gateway building and campus extension. Can you? Can you? Okay. I'm the architect who led the team that created the new gateway building and campus extension. The architecture, the architectural narrative of the new building celebrates the history of this freeman's village and its rediscovery, framing views of the houses and reinvesting pastoral vistas. The project received national press coverage and was recognized by the New York City Public Design Commission, the AIA, the National Organi Organization of Minority Architects, the Municipal Arts Society, and the Historic District Council. Our new educational building for the Louis Armstrong Museum in Corona, Queens, helps point to the anchor of Louis and Lucille's home, creating a strong sense of place where this great artist lived and practiced while reinforcing the scale of the existing neighborhood fabric. And yet this new building also adds a bright, shiny note that points to the joyous singularity of Lewis music. I have dedicated my career to architectural design because landmarks have touched me personally and professionally. I came to the United States at the age of 12 from my native country of Panama. I was lucky to be raised in the, in the Bronx, down the street from the Hunts Point Library. Unbeknownst to me at the time, it was the last Carnegie Library to be built in 1927. Designed by Carreras and Hastings, it's now a design, designated landmark. What it meant to me as I spent many after school hours there, was that it was a special place in the city where an immigrant boy felt welcome. I still believe that stories like mine show, that, show the way that landmarks can speak to everyone. To be able to give back is truly a blessing. Shall I be approved to serve on the LPC? My experience will provide a critical grounding for considering new buildings in historic context. I'm a firm believer that mindful combination of new and old buildings in addition to existing structures within old fabrics are crucial, not only for the city, but for all of us to leave our mark of our time and place. It's been my privilege to work in these landmarks contexts, and I'm honored to be nominated to continue building that heritage in a different way as part of the Landmark Preservation Commission. Thank you for your consideration of my nomination, and I look forward to taking your questions.
Thank you. I'm going to open the floor. Anybody have any questions? Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Jefferson. It's great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, when you and I spoke a few weeks ago, I, I relayed to you uh, my excitement at your nomination for this position, uh, being a person of color, coming on board, um, and lending your expertise in architecture and so much more throughout the city. What do you consider, and if you will share with the panel, your greatest asset that you will be bringing to this role? My professional and community experience is an asset I would bring. In addition to that, I want to bring two things to, to the commission. One is to bring a, a slightly different lens at looking at the urban fabric, particularly the boroughs, and to see things that are hidden, uh, uh, what I call uh, what I call uh, cultural items that are hidden in plain sight. And to do that, we need to really look again at the fabric and expose that, uncover those items. The second thing I want to bring is a type of outreach that's slightly different from the typical outreach. It's an outreach where the community uh, discovers these items. For example, Weeksville Heritage Center with an incredible example of that, where the community itself found the, the existing buildings. Well, thank you for that response. I certainly welcome your perspective. Um, I welcome your insight, your nuances, all of those good things. And again, uh, per our conversation, just some more things that we want to look at throughout the entire city um, on on every level and every lens. There are districts that we know um, have not been proportionately included in landmarking as being the chair of the committee. It's been a very interesting year and a half for me and we've seen some beautiful landmarks take place, by the way. Um, but I just see it as we still need more. Harlem is underrepresented in landmarking as is you know, parts of Queens and other places throughout in Brooklyn. Throughout, um, throughout the city, so I look forward to your perspective. I look forward to sitting down with you in the future um, and, and, and taking a look at some more ideas that you may have to, to broaden that lens across the city. So thank you for your testimony and congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Jefferson, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, from your testimony, uh, I wanted to ask you in terms of um, the idea of cultural landmark, that certain community have you know, historic value, might, they might not have specific buildings uh, or enough building to be considered a historic district. Uh, in my district, I represent Lower Manhattan, uh, district number one, and that's where the city began. I have right now working with community to look at a Lower East Side historic district where a lot of tenement buildings are. And then we also want to look at, you know, historic area like Chinatown, Little Italy. Um, we have seen, you know, building gets torn down, new buildings goes up. And I was really interested in, in your, uh, what you mentioned about outreach. Right now we're having problem kind of explaining to building owners the value of being in a historic area uh, and how that would also enhance their property value. Uh, but that is something that a lot of time individual buildings, they just don't want. They say, oh no, no, we don't want to be landmark. It's too much headache, too much problem. But these are historic sites. Uh, as you said earlier, it has a lot of you know, hidden value uh, that are unknown to the general public or even in their own community. Uh, for example, in Chinatown, um, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who's the founding father uh, of the Republic, the first Republic in Asia, he did a lot of organizing in the community to get support. 
but there's no building that he has had meetings with. People don't even know that he has done that. I mean, now we have a statue of him in the park, but there's so many, you know, about hidden treasure in the Lower East Side and in Chinatown. So I guess my question to you is like, how to really help as a commission member to really help do that outreach and really engage the community and to really dismiss, you know, demystify what this whole, you know, landmark so that they don't see all the obstacle, but then they begin to see the value of that. Well, the values, the values are very clear. It tells the history of our city. It tells the history of us living here. The other issue of, uh, you mentioned the, the landmarking of just aesthetic objects. That's one landmarking process. The other is, is, his, is you said, the, uh, uh, stuck, um, cultural, cultural, significant cultural landmarks are important. And they're, they're both important, but right now cultural ones are, are, are important. I really look forward to working with you because the way sometimes the districts are called and then one of the questions like property owner have, well, how come the building next door is not included? So I think from your uh, testimony early, like how do you bring the new and the old together that within the landmarking district, you can have a broader area that maybe could include every building and not so much as say, well, this building doesn't have any more it got changed so much, so it really doesn't qualify. And people really doesn't understand. You know, I'm in the district, I'm in the, in the boundary, but my next door neighbor is not. So those are the things that I think we really have to kind of work at and, and get the community to understand and to engage that maybe it could be a broad area um, that we can call it you know, a historic district. Yeah. So thank you and I uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a question. On September 10, 2019, you received a written waiver from the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board concerning your partnership and role at your firm, Jefferson Architects. The firm currently has one project before the LPC, has had at least two projects in the past, and may continue to have projects before the LPC in the future. Pursuant to this waiver, you have to cease work on and have no personal involvement in such projects involving landmark designated properties. That may go before LPC or its staff. This includes not participating in discussions, emails, conversations, conference calls, receiving relevant documents, and not being compensated for the firm's work before LPC. For the record, you will abide by the guidelines of the waiver. Can I'll, you I'll, address that? Yes, I'll comply with the waiver. You will comply. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very, very much. Oh, should we go on this? Okay. And now, Environmental Control Board. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Within the New York City Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, there is an environmental control board that ad adjudicates notices of violations issued by various city agencies, including the Departments of Environmental Protection, Police Sanitation, Health and Mental Hygiene, Fire and Buildings. ECB has the power to render decisions and orders and to impose civil penalty penalties under law and may apply to a court of competent jurisdiction for enforcement of any decision, order, or subpoena that it, it issues. Among the provisions of law enforced by ECB are those relating to the cleanliness of city streets, the disposal of waste, the provisions of a pure, wholesome, and adequate supply of water, the prevention, the prevention of air, water, and noise pollution, the regulation of street peddling, 
and the city responses to emergencies caused by releases or threatened releases of hazardous substances. ECB consists of the commissioners of the Departments of Environmental Protection, Sanitation, Health and Mental Hygiene, Buildings, Police, Fire, and the Chief Administrative Law Judge of Oath, as well as six persons appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council. The Chief Administrative Judge of Oath serves as chair of ECB. Within its appropriation, ECB may appoint an executive director and such hearing offices, including non-salaried hearing offices and other employees as it finds necessary to properly perform its duties. Members other than agency commissioners may not be employed by the city. Five of the, of the six non-commission members must possess broad general background and experience, one in each of the following areas. Air pollution, water pollution, control, noise, pollution control, real estate, or business. The, the sixth non-commissioner member represents the general public. Members other than the agency commissioners are compensated and receive $175 and 10 cents per diem when performing the work of ECB. Member terms are for four years. Welcome, Mr. Whittington. Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you re want to make a statement? Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Kozlowitz, Speaker Johnson, and members of the Rules, Privileges, and Elections Committee of this New York City Council. My name is Jared Whittington, and I am honored to appear before you today for consideration as a nominee to be the Noise Specialist of the Environmental Control Board. For the past 13 years, I have worked in New York City as an acoustical consultant for one of the most well-respected firms in the industry. During that time, I have had the opportunity to be an integral part of the acoustic design for nearly every type of new construction imaginable, from elementary schools to luxury high-rises, from hospitals to laboratories to art museums and to recording studios. In addition, my role as a noise expert means that I'm often called upon to help in situations where noise pollution has become a nuisance for New York City residents. Insufficient sound isolation between apartments, noisy trucks idling in residential neighborhoods, rooftop mechanical equipment next to bedroom windows. Living in the most densely populated city in America means that these types of issues are virtually un unavoidable. It is therefore critical that our city's administrative codes be fair, reasonable, and enforceable. People need to be able to fall asleep, even in a city that never does. At the same time, it is equally important that there be a system in place whereby New Yorkers can contest issuances of violation by enforcing agencies. Every situation is different, and no city agency can be expected to get things exactly right 100% of the time. And that's why I wish to be considered for this appointment. I have a strong desire to help my city and to help my fellow New Yorkers toward a more just society. I believe that the system should work for all people, and that everyone should have the opportunity to have their voices heard, to plead their case, and to be treated fairly. Thank you again for considering my nomination to the Environmental Control Board, and I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I open the floor. Anybody have any questions? I have a couple. Okay. Not many. What is your experience with projects that involve the New York City Noise Code and Building Code re with respect to noise? Well, I have quite a bit of experience. Um, involving the noise code and the building code. Um, almost every residential project has building code requirements for sound separation, um, and we work with architects and developers to ensure that that is in place, and we try to push for even higher than building code in most instances. Um, I have done a lot of work with E designations, um, with the OER, um, for window, uh, 
OITC requirements, which means how much sound passes from the street into the apartments. And uh, New York City administrative code, we've done a lot of uh, uh, environmental surveys, particularly when there's a complaint for uh, rooftop equipment or it, you know, when there's street noise that's uh, excessive. Um, we've done quite a bit of that work in the last 13 years. Okay. Are there any procedures you would seek to implement that would help to modernize and improve the efficiency of proceedings before the ECB? Well, I know that the ECB um, is an adjudicating body, and so um, it's very important that, the, uh, that it's properly staffed and, and that the staff are properly trained. So I think that you know, if, if I uh, attain this position, I would, I would look to see that, that uh, we, are, we are doing those things properly and that, uh, you know, that I offer as much guidance as I can as, as a noise specialist to that end. Any um, comments from the public? Seeing none, I think we can go to a vote. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote committee on rules, privileges, and elections, M178 and 179. Items are coupled. Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye on both candidates. Gibson. I vote aye. Chin. Aye on all. Espinal. Lanceman. Aye. Traeger. Aye. Adams. Aye. Matteo. Aye. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, both items have been adopted by the committee. Afternoon. Uh -huh. So one thirty will be the full vote. Everything will be fine. Then I'll send you a, the use of this.